if you're a, if you're a solopreneur out there, you need a posse. This is, goes back to my early work with who's got your back. You need a you need a what I call a co-elevating team. So co-elevation is when a group of people are committed to raising each other's game, going mm-hmm. higher together. This is what I believe all standing teams need to be. We need all teams to be co-elevating. Hey, Nick Nanton here, and thanks for tuning in to Now to Next. I want to make sure you don't miss a single episode of this show on YouTube. So before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You'll have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, just go into your settings and switch on notifications. Thanks for watching. Hey, everyone. Nick Nanton here. Welcome back to Now to Next. I have a really fun guest and really informative guest based on where we are in this crazy what part of the pandemic are we in world, uh, which I feel like I thought that was going to be answered in the first 30 days of the pandemic, and clearly that wasn't. Uh, and so who knows where we go from here, but what is good is to have uh, is to have a plan and, and to do what my mentor, Dan Sullivan, says, to think about your thinking. What is different? What is shifting? What is changing? So we're just not caught off guard. And we're going to talk about how to be proactive about that with uh, my guest, Keith Ferrazzi's new book. I'll lead in with a with a bio just so people know who I'm speaking with here uh, in about 90 seconds. But uh, Keith Ferrazzi is an author, entrepreneur, and the founder and chairman of Ferrazzi Greenlight, a research-based consulting and training company. A graduate of Harvard Business School, Keith became the youngest chief marketing officer of a Fortune 500 company during his career at Deloitte and later became CMO and head of sales at Starwood Hotels. He has contributed to Harvard Business Review. View, Forbes, Fortune, and the Wall Street Journal, and is the New York Times number one best-selling author of Who's Got Your Back, Never Eat Alone, and Leading Without Authority. Keith's latest book, which is what we're going to mostly talk about today, Competing in the New World of Work, How Radical Adaptability Separates the Best from the Rest, is based on 2,000 interviews he and his team conducted with leaders throughout the pandemic. The book provides a guideline for how we can all capitalize on what we've learned over the past two years to stay competitive in the workplace of the future. And the book gives actionable advice that anyone can follow to create a mindset of radical adaptability, which is needed now more than ever. Uh, so, hey, Keith, welcome to the show. Uh, really excited to have you. We're going to talk about your new book. We're going to talk about networking. There's so much to cover. Uh, thanks so much for joining me. Dude, thanks a lot, and it's great to see you again. I'm looking forward to this conversation. Love it. And again, you guys, you can get more of this info all in Keith's new book, Competing in the New World of Work, How Radical Adaptability Separates the Best from the Rest. A couple of comments there, Keith. Um Adaptability is such a unique skill because as we, so like first, the first thing that many people would think when they hear, uh, and I'm not going to rule myself out of this either, by the way, I think that, that being vulnerable is the key here. Like you hear that and you go, oh, well, that's a multi-million dollar corporation, but they've got the time to screw around with things like that. But really taking no. taking action very quickly would be easy if you just start looking at things instead of like, I, I was on a Good. podcast the other day with a guy who has a bunch of real estate agents that follow him, right? You know, hundreds of thousands of real estate agents and everything that I had to do, I had to flip from company to solopreneur, right? And, uh, and I just thought about this. I said, look, you know, if you're a financial services rep, we did this actually, I'll, I'll say with, uh, with Merrill Lynch during the pandemic. If you're, a, if you're a solopreneur out there, you need a posse. This is, goes back to my early work with who's got your back. You need a, you need a, what I call a co-elevating team. So co-elevation is when a group of people are committed to raising each other's game, going higher together. This is what I believe all standing teams need to be. We need all teams to be co-elevating. During the pandemic, people said bullshit about turf. Sharp elbows weren't sharp anymore. We got it done as a team. We went higher together for survival, mind you, but we did it, right? You as an individual can get your co-elevating team, your posse, your peer-to-peer group. Peter Dimandis and I, every Sunday, we're having a check-in. Every Sunday, he and I would get together with two or three other people. We would just do a check-in and we would figure out what's going on personally or professionally in our lives at the peak of the pandemic because we had each other's backs, right? Now, you do that and you can put the foresight question into that. Peter and I were always asking, what risks are, do we think we're not seeing? What opportunities are we missing? We started investing together as a result. We did projects together as a result. Every one of you needs this posse. You don't have to be a, a Fortune 500, Fortune 50 company to, to get this principle. 
I love that. And one of the things I think that you sort of hacked that system too was you got together a group of people who you enjoyed spending time with. So you, you enjoyed it. So it's like, how can we make this something that, that I want to do? And obviously the, the byproducts of that are probably even greater. Um, it was really interesting too. I was doing an interview at a, uh, the president of a major corporation not long ago, and I was on their campus, right? They're big enough that they had a campus. And I was just like, the parking lot was like maybe 10% full. And I, I felt so bad because I know how this happens and it was not, they didn't do anything wrong, but like in the 80s, 90s, 2000s, 2010s, and he, right up to 2020, whenever you wanted to grow, the next question was, well, where are we going to put them? I guess we're going to have to build another building. Okay, and it's wasn't, like, oh. wasn't it ironic as hell? that Zoom was right in the middle of building a massive campus before the pandemic. I mean, I, I, seriously, seriously. I think that was, I mean, Eric Yoon is brilliant as a guy, but he had to look at himself and say, shit, shit. <laughs> all the money that he spent when the rest of the world were closing down their campuses, all state, by the way, during the pandemic, they ended up closing down this massive bo behemoth of a, of, a, of a structure that they had out in the suburbs and they created a small office downtown Chicago. Um, and that's now their office and they're fully virtual. Tom is very progressive out there at Allstate. I've been working with their organization some lately. Uh, very impressed by them. Love that. Now, the hardest part, like, so where do you begin when it comes to adaptability? Because I feel like we all would say, oh, I'm pretty adaptable. Um, but really, as it comes to it, I think we we don't probably test our systems, yeah. look at things yeah. enough the yeah. way we've always done to adapt more. I'll like, where should where we begin? begin? Yep, i tell you where we begin. Um, you're right. We all were pretty proud of ourselves for how damn adaptable we were during the pandemic. But you know what I call that? I call that crisis agile. We, we During the pandemic, we were practicing crisis agile. I was coaching the Delta Airlines team going into the pandemic. This is one of the best airlines in the world prior to the pandemic. They had made an absolute commitment to reinvent the travel industry on a quarterly basis. I was working with the executive team to rethink models, just totally rethink the way that the travel industry was run. Pandemic hits. So what we were doing back then is we were practicing quarterly agile meetings to reinvent the strategy and the future of the company, right? The pandemic hits. Boom. Now we're into daily agile sprints. Why? Because we lost 90% of our revenue. What is an agile sprint? An agile sprint is when you as a team decide, okay, what are we going to do in this next period of time? In a, in a less crisis world, that's usually a week or two, All right? You go and you do that work. Now at the end of it, you assess, what have we done? Where have we struggled? The humility of asking the question, where have we struggled is crucial. Nothing's worse than a team that shows up and talks about what they've done and puts a, a shiny penny picture on things, you always have to ask the question, where have you struggled? And, you know, uh, Alan Mulally of um, Ford, you know, used to really celebrate people who would bring him the problems. And very few organizations do that. So what have I done? Where have I struggled? And where am I going in the next sprint? Then you, you beat the hell out of that as a team. Now this is, you take a look at Ray Dalio's uh, book called Principles where he talks about this radical candor the Kim Malone Scott used to talk about, radical candor, peer-to-peer -peer feedback, you know, all this constructive criticism dialogue. And I said that to, uh, to Ray when I met him at the TED conference, I said, you know, Ray, I really love your work, but dude, you hire assholes. Like, how do you create this culture of, of in, in an organization that where you're not hiring a bunch of eviscerating people who wanna shoot each other all the time? And the answer is you need to create a culture where people have each other's back so much that they can't let each other fail. I call it bulletproofing. So here you go. Now let me put it all together. You, you negotiate an agile sprint of a week or two with your team. Here's what we're gonna do. We show up at the end of that. We stress test it, we bulletproof it. We reinvent the contract of the team where everybody is wrestling this idea together. We're, and, and then we're figuring out, okay, fine. Now where are we going for the next two weeks? That is the that is the operating system for a radically uh, adaptable company. Yeah, I would say one of the things I've been talking about a lot recently is I really never made the connection uh, in business and culture. Obviously, it's a really it was a big discussion. I mean, you and I both knew Tony Shea. I mean, it, I I got it in a sense, but when I really now that I 
over the pandemic took the time to do the work and we sort of rebuilt our business with different structure and and I was more involved. Uh, and really culture is, the, the way someone else simplified it to me is that small businesses, particularly in growing businesses and, and startup businesses, typically uh, are ba- where well, they succeed, they're unique because of the the guiding principles and thoughts of their founder. And one of the only ways to continue that is to to bake those in to the way the business operates, which really is culture and and how and and teaching people how do we respond to something like this? How do we respond to a, a customer complaint or a customer idea or whatever it might be? And so I never, uh, man, I never, I never really had broken it down. But at the end of the day, I'm just blown away by how far we got without having really a culture. And yeah. and now, especially more than ever, when we we can't even cobble together the culture we could before of getting together for happy hours and other things because everyone's in different states, which gives me the ability to not hire assholes, by the way. I don't have to go from the same area. I can find the best person for the job. But having finding a way to build that culture uh, is, is a different struggle uh, with with virtual teams than it was in person. Well, you know, it's interesting. We all have cultures. This is one of the things I do when I'm coaching teams. I go into teams and I'm like, okay, so let's talk about the culture of this team. And they, they show me some document of values. I'm yeah. like, bullshit, I don't want to talk about that because the chances are you don't live those things. So when I interview the executives on an executive team that I'm about to coach, I'll come back and I'll say, okay, I'll tell you what your culture is. Um, you're there for each other when you need each other, which is great. You talk behind each other's backs like third graders um, all the time. Um, you're like, it's worse. It's like mean girls. It's like the, you all are throwing each other under, under the bus behind each other's backs. Real things get done in the shadows through lobbying. That's that's Now, that's your culture, guys. That's your culture. So now what do we want our culture to be? So the culture is nothing more than the aggregated set of behaviors. You just have to identify your culture is your behaviors. And let's get transparent and clear about them and then begin to identify an old set and a new set. Let's recontract to the new set and then let's adopt a set of practices that'll get you there. Yeah, so it's it's unintentional or intentional, but you have it either way. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Hey, I don't know. I don't know if you knew this. I, you didn't mention this. You know what this is? No, what is that? It's Tony Shea's shoe. Oh, wow. So Tony Shea, for those of you who don't know Tony, uh, Tony passed away very tragically during the pandemic. Um, And he was one of the greatest innovators around human capital that the world has ever seen in a businessman. He, you know, innovated around employee engagement. He innovated around self-managed holocratic teams. He innovated around resource allocation. And the loss of Tony was going to be a great loss to society for that kind of innovation. So we created the Tony Shea Award. And the Tony Shea Award, you can go to thetonysheaaward.com, collects entrepreneurs and business leaders who are innovating on the edge with their teams, with their companies. And I invite anybody here to go there and apply for the Tony Shea Award if you're doing something particularly clever or unique. And uh, we have an annual award now for for Tony Shea. I don't know, Nick, if you knew about that. Uh, I'd heard a little bit about it, but I love it. I mean, he was uh, a really giving guy. He had no reason to give a guy like me any time at all. And then any time I asked for it, he was uh, he was very generous with it. So he's a great guy, great guy to model. I agree. Um, you talk about in in chapter two of the book, you talk about collaborating through inclusion. Let's, I mean, uh, right now, obviously, DEI, you know, or DNI, diversity and inclusion, and I mean, it's a big, it's a big term, it's a big buzzword. But what does it really mean, other than going to get another certificate so you can prove you dis- belong in a job? Yeah. So there were two things going on during the pandemic um, around the world. Inclusion, the biggest thing, and the thing that had the most val- volume was DEI. So making sure that we have uh, an appropriately fair and diverse workplace. Now, once that's achieved, by the way, you have a long way to go, but once we achieve diversity in the workplace, um, it's a shame because we don't, people aren't heard. You know, on an average meeting of 12 people, only four people walk out feeling they've been hurt, right? And what we wanted to focus on is a chapter where organizations were finally waking up because of the equality of these little tiles that you now live in, right? What has that done to making sure people are fully heard, that there is an inclusion 
of people's voices. Now, many companies didn't do anything about it. So prior to the pandemic, they met in a group of 12 people, four people were heard. They move in, they move from synchronous work, which is like working in meetings physically to working in meetings remotely. And they didn't change any of their damn rules. But we looked at companies that changed their rules. We looked at companies that instead of having a meeting, they would have a dialogue in the cloud around critical issues where everybody was heard, right? You give, you give not just the charismatic person who can think on their feet quick, but you give everybody two days to think about a subject and add what they think about a particular topic in the cloud, meaning in a, in a Google doc or a SharePoint document or, 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 in, or in Slack or in Teams, right? And all of a sudden you start to hear everyone's voices. There was a woman that we uh, interviewed, you know, there, there's this wonderful uh, whiteboarding technology I love called mural, mural boards. And there was this company that was doing product design and it was doing its product design in its headquarters. And then they would hand off the product design to uh, different parts of the world for execution. Well, all of a sudden the woman down in Argentina who prior was a handoff was actually being able to be involved in the ideation and innovation sessions. Tears in her eyes when she won the best design of the year award during the pandemic, because all of a sudden she was invited in when she wasn't invited in previously because of technology and the equalization of hybrid work. So there's so many things we, you know, we actually, um, uh, we did a really big study around hybrid work and fundamentally looked at how do we reboot our team's way of working, not just using tools for old ways of working, but using new ways of working for these tools. And uh, I think we just came up with, I'll, I'll check it out. I think the website we came up with that has a new ebook we created, giving away for you for free. I think it's called Hybrid Work Wins or something like that. I'll, I'll look it up and I'll let you know. That sounds great. Um, hybrid, team, hybrid Teams Win, hybridteamswin.com. Any uh, any quick bullet points of, of anything most fascinating that you figured out during that? Yeah, number one is the most powerful form of collaboration doesn't start with meetings. It's asynchronous collaboration. If you can shift to predominantly collaborating asynchronously, you can radically reduce the number of meetings you have to go to. You can improve the innovation and inclusion. You can you can bolt you can team out and include more people in the ideation phase and get bolder, more transparent, more candid input. Asynchronous collaboration is where collaboration starts. That's the biggest awakening that we found out uh, during this. And there, there's a lot more, but you land on that one, you'll reinvent your team and your company. Wow, love it. I mean, I guess, yeah, that allows you to get the greatest talent in any time zone too. I mean, right, you can, you can go anywhere, great. Um, you also talk in the book about uh, promoting team resilience. Tell me, Tell me a bit about that. Yeah, so during the pandemic, um, more people were vulnerable and transparent and authentic than ever before. You saw you know, people that you never saw show emotion, show emotion when their parents were in assisted living facilities and, and struggling there, et cetera. Um, there was a massive awakening to teams showing up their full authentic self, right? Now, what we looked at, and I, I wrote a piece in Harvard Business Review during all of this, seven strategies for building a more resilient team. And I'd say that there are a couple of two big takeaways. One, we've already talked about. The biggest drain in team resilience, team energy, team mental well being is actually the bullshit of getting stuff done. If you change the way you work more collaboratively, more inclusively, people's voices feeling heard. So everything I just talked about in the collaboration chapter of the book. So like I said, the book has a chapter on foresight, a chapter on agility, a chapter on collaboration and inclusion, a chapter on resilience. The thing about the resilience chapter is if you do the chapter on collaboration and inclusion well, you build resilience. People are drained because of shitty ways of working. The second thing in the big shift was, can the team own each other's energy? Because of the authenticity and vulnerability of a team, we leaned in, we cared, we supported, we said, are you okay? That became a norm where the team took care of each other. Well, that needs to shift again as a team norm 
And you can do that by exercises that never happened. So we measured in the olden days how bonded teams were. A scale of zero to five, teams are typically bonded in the high twos. If you were more purposeful in the remote world where you would stop in the meetings and you would have things called personal professional check-in, people talking about where they're struggling personally and professionally, uh, sweet and sour, everybody go, what's, what's sweet and sour in your life? Simple exercises in a more purposeful way. We were able to raise the bondedness of a team in a virtual world higher than it was before. Whereas the average leader will say, my team is no longer as bonded as it used to be when it was in person. If you take a team that didn't have intentional bonding practices, move it virtual and don't add intentional bonding practices, yes, team's energy goes down from where it was. If you take a team that had virtual energy, uh, vir uh, that had no intentional bonding practices, put it into virtual, add intentional bonding practices, the energy goes up from what it was before. Now imagine once we're in a hybrid world where we're both personal and remote and we're doing physical and then we're doing intentional bonding when we're together. I used to go to leadership offsites and I, cause I was coaching the team. I'd go to a leadership offsite and they'd have these dinners the night before the leadership offsite. And it was just bullshit small talk. Now I go in and I'm like, listen, we're not going to do bullshit small talk. We're going to go around and we're going to share deeply and authentically what's going on in our lives. That it was game changing, game changing. So we didn't have good hygiene to own each other's resilience, the care and relationships and energy in the past. Those teams that failed to do it remote suffered. Those teams that did it were better than they were before. Uh, I love that. I'd love some best practice here because Keith, we've all been to those dinners, like you just talked about, where you know, uh, everyone's got to stand up and say their whatever it's going to be. It could be what's good, what's bad. And they, any best practices for how to not make those things just drag on? Because I've always found in a lot of those cases by, you know, by the fourth person in everyone's sort of tuning out. So do you, did you do it in small groups, whoever's at your table? Did you like, like, give me ideas there. Well, first of all, um, I don't think you can, well, uh, here's the, here's the calculus of this. If the shares are, are not real, not deep, not dramatic, then everyone's going to be bored. If they're just talking about kids and soccer and whatever, who gives a damn, right? But if, if you're a leader and you lead with real authenticity and you're sharing about the fact that your marriage is struggling right now because, you know, the, the workload or um, your, my oldest kid just got thrown out of another rehab and I'm trying to figure out where to draw the line. Like at what point do I say to him, I'm not responsible for your life anymore. Come back when you're ready, right? I mean, these are these are tough things and they're real and you won't lose attention for those. Right. Uh, that is yep. So that's that's great insight. It's it's really about well, it's about the intentionality of the share and and really the question you're asking them to lean into. So uh, I love that. Um well look, uh we have a couple minutes left. One of the things I, I would love to talk about is uh, because I know you're a big advocate of uh, of the foster care system uh, and and how to maybe make it better. I think, you know, one of the things I would love to, it's a totally different subject, but you're brilliant on it. And I'd love, maybe we insert a bit of a dream in someone listening today. So tell me a little bit about your involvement in the foster care system and and, and just your thoughts in general. Yeah, thanks. Um, it, is a, it is a very personal passion. So let me shock you a little bit. Um, you, you not, you've heard this before, but 80% of the US prison population came from foster care. So this is how broken the foster care system is. And if we don't fix it, look at the downstream ills. And why? It, my, my older son's a great example. I, my older son, I got him at 16, been at 21 homes before he came into our home. And um, he, even with our love, even with our commitment, uh, he went to jail twice. Right. We're talking about psychological damage that occurs to somebody when they're abused at a at a at a very impressionable age by their parents. And then they're treated like transactional meat in the system where they're maximized for the 750 bucks a head they get, the parents get for them. Right. So we've got to we've got to change the 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 social uh, system around foster care. Number one, 
We've got to make sure that middle class families, loving families of all socioeconomic backgrounds, we got to make sure that the the number of people wanting to do foster care to make extra money goes to zero, right? We need to make sure that the people who are doing it are doing it for the love of the children. And we wanna make sure that these parents have an increased interest in permanency, meaning most foster kids by the time they're 18, they're, they're no longer supported in foster care. You know, and that's, that's, that's our obligation. By the time they're 18, they're no longer supported. Well, fine, some states have taken that to 21, but who cares? You're, they're still not supported. Whereas our boys, there are boys forever, right? We need that social commitment in foster care and we need families who are willing to sign up for that long-term commitment, independent of whether they're being paid. And that's a big deal. We've, in our, in our foundation, if you go to greenlightgiving.com, that's where we focus a lot of our focus. We do the Tony Shea Award, we do foster care and a few other things. Um, the second thing is while these parents in foster care are in foster care, like myself, um, we need peer-to-peer -peer support because it's tough. It's tough. I mean, there were times, uh, you know, my partner and I went to bed at night and we were, we would, we would joke at the beginning, but very seriously, we'd be like, okay, well, at the beginning it was very serious. And later we joked, but it was like, um, there, the, the first night we went to bed and we said, there's a good chance we'll get killed by our child. There's a good chance. And then Periodically, we would joke, we would say, okay, what do you think the percentage chance is tonight, right? And, you know, there was, all, there was yeah, a good 50-50, a lot of nights that we thought some, you know, our child who was hyper-violent uh, and, and, and a very challenging kid, and, but he was our boy, and that was it. So, look, that was, a, that was a hard case. I'm not just trying to discourage anybody from getting into foster care. But the point is that those of us who decide to go down that path, we, we created a peer-to-peer -peer support structure around us with other parents. That really was the saving grace um, that I think, go if you're, if you're interested in your, in LA, happen to be in LA, I know this is global show, but uh, go to uh, Kids Save, K-I-D-S-A-V-E, -E, and uh, Kids Save, and take a look at what the work they're doing there. It's extraordinary. Thanks for asking, Nick. You know, I love that. And it's one of those things that I'm, I'm intrigued by, but afraid of. And I think a lot of people are as well. And, and I know, uh, you know, uh, the depth of new relationships, particularly relationships in a place that you can invest in a way no one else is willing to, uh, is, is an incredible, an incredible thing to do. So I, I salute you for that. And, uh, I hope, I hope some other people on this, uh, listening will catch that dream somehow. So, uh, Keith, I also know uh, those who go and check out your new book, uh, they can go to radic uh, radicallyadapt.com, and there's a free video series that can help you through this process. So I would highly encourage people to check that as well. Uh, in closing, Keith, anything uh, we didn't cover that you think is important for people to know? No, look, I just wanted to scare everybody that I don't believe you've gone far enough. Um, we had this two-year inflection point and if you haven't rebooted how you lead, if you haven't rebooted your business model, if you haven't rebooted how your teams engage with each other, if you haven't rebooted how you work using new technology, you haven't gone far enough. And I really suggest that you lean in and learn. We have 2000 executives points of view on what does a post pandemic way of leading and working look like. Um, there it is, it's crowdsourced. It's a great set of content. It's Harvard's top pick coming out of the pandemic. Uh, don't go back to work. Don't ever go back to work. Go forward to work. I love it. Well, thank you so much for joining me, Keith. And everyone, check out Keith's books and uh, all of his stuff, all the resources. Uh, we appreciate having you. And we'll see you guys next time on Now to Next. Thanks, Keith. Thanks, Nick. Hey, Nick Nanton here, and thanks for tuning in to Now to Next. I want to make sure you don't miss a single episode of this show on YouTube, so be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, just go into your settings and switch on notifications. Thanks for watching.